Okay, as you can see here, we've got our salt water. So we have about somewhere between two and three mils of salt water in each of these six test tubes. Now going along with our reaction series, we're going to add our um, second reactant to each of these test tubes to check for a double displacement reaction. We've got calcium hydroxide, copper sulfate, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, calcium chloride, and potassium chloride. Those are the six things that we're going to add to these test tubes, which all just contain salt water right now, sodium chloride. Let's begin. We'll start with our calcium hydroxide. This is barely soluble in water. Most of it is settled to the bottom of the beaker. So let's sprinkle some of that in. Next, we'll do our copper sulfate. Next, our hydrochloric acid, our sodium hydroxide, calcium chloride, and potassium chloride. Okay, I'm looking at these test tubes right now and I see no indication of a reaction, no color change, no bubbles to indicate a gas, no precipitate at the bottom. So it appears that none of the salt water has reacted with these other compounds. All right, so here's our salt water. And we saw that the salt water didn't react with any of the six other compounds. What I'm going to do now is explain why. So in our first beaker over here, I'm sorry, our first test tube, we've got calcium hydroxide and salt water. Um, so the sodium chloride could react with the calcium hydroxide, but then we'd have calcium chloride, which is water soluble, and sodium hydroxide, which is also soluble. So no reason for that reaction to go. Again, a double dis displacement reaction will only occur if a gas is formed, a solid is formed, or a um, covalent compound is formed, such as water. Uh, so that first reaction didn't meet any of those, criterion, uh, uh, those criteria, so no reaction. Second reaction, we have copper sulfate and salt water. That could form sodium sulfate and also uh, copper chloride. Both of those things are water soluble, so no reaction. Uh, next one, we have sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid. There's no reason for this reaction to happen, right? We'd just be trading chlorine for chlorine, so why bother? Uh, same thing over here, we have sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide. Both of these compounds have sodium in them, so why would sodium switch with sodium? It wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything in the, in the grand scheme of things. Same thing with calcium chloride, it's got chloride in it, same thing as sodium chloride, so chlorine wouldn't switch with chlorine, doesn't make any sense, wouldn't contribute. And finally, same thing with potassium chloride. Chlorine, chlorine, no reason for the reaction to happen. So uh, there are the answers for our sodium chloride series. Now we're looking at our um, calcium hydroxide reaction series. We've got about two to three milliliters of calcium hydroxide in each of these test tubes. Calcium hydroxide is um, pretty much insoluble in water. So we basically have kind of a little bit of cloudiness in these. Um, most of the calcium hydroxide is settled to the bottom of the container. It looks like this. So um, we're gonna see what we can see here. Um, we're going to put our copper sulfate in the first one, then hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, calcium chloride, and potassium chloride. Let's start with our copper sulfate. Hydrochloric acid. Sodium hydroxide. Calcium chloride, and potassium chloride. 
Okay, looking at these, don't see much indication of a reaction, except looking at our copper sulfate here. Let's see if we can focus in on that. Uh, there's some cloudiness. It looks like a precipitate is forming. Let's see what happens if we add some of our solid to these. Oh yeah, if you look at the copper sulfate, it reacts pretty much instantly. Gets chunky. Kind of an inconsistent texture in there. All the rest of these kind of look like we expect them to just kind of cloudy, with the possible exception of with the HCl here. With the HCl, it precipitated almost immediately, right out to the bottom. So uh, those two seem very different from the rest. So the HCl and the copper sulfate seem to react right away. The rest of these just kind of look cloudy and insoluble like copper sulfate typically does. This is the um, calcium hydroxide up close. The calcium hydroxide that was formed in the reaction between, I'm sorry, not calcium hydroxide, copper sulfate that was formed in the reaction between copper sulfate and calcium hydroxide. It formed this calcium sulfate, kind of snotty looking stuff in there. Okay, so here are the answers for our um, uh, calcium hydroxide activity series. This is kind of a weird one to do because the calcium hydroxide is already insoluble in water, so it's kind of hard to see any sort of reaction at all, uh, except in the case of the um, uh, calcium uh, hydroxide and the copper sulfate. So in this one, basically the calcium and the copper switch place and we end up with calcium sulfate, which is insoluble, which kind of forms this kind of like uh, almost snot looking stuff. You can see that there. Real pretty. Um, with our hydrogen uh, chloride or our hydrochloric acid, you can see a reaction happen right away too, and that it settled much faster than all of our other ones. With that particular reaction, what happens is uh, the calcium from the calcium hydroxide kind of gloms onto the chlorine from the hydrochloric acid, and we end up with calcium chloride, which is water soluble. Um, and the uh, OH from the calcium hydroxide gloms onto the hydrogen from the hydrochloric acid, and we form water. So, what this does is it takes a lot of the stuff out of solution and makes it soluble. And basically, that, that insoluble stuff is left in the bottom. That's just unreacted calcium. So if we formed soluble compounds, why, do we, why did this reaction happen? Well, it's because water was formed. As you know, water is a covalent compound, and one of the reasons for a double displacement reaction to happen is the formation of a covalent compound. So for this activity series, we did not have any reactions with the three on the right. That's the sodium hydroxide, the calcium chloride, and the potassium chloride. We did have reactions with the copper sulfate, where a solid was formed. That's the calcium sulfate. And with the um, hydrochloric acid, where it basically neutralized to form water. Hydrochloric acid, you'll learn later, is a strong acid. And um, the calcium hydroxide is a base. So um, there you go. Right, next up we have our copper sulfate activity series. The copper sulfate to begin with kind of has this beautiful blue color. Let's add our second reactants. So we're going to start with some hydrochloric acid. sodium hydroxide. 
calcium chloride and some potassium chloride. Well, it looks like right away we have some reactions. Uh, the most obvious of which would be the sodium hydroxide. When the copper sulfate reacts with the sodium hydroxide, we basically get copper hydroxide and sodium sulfate. And the copper hydroxide is insoluble. So we get this kind of goopy looking um, precipitate forming up at the top in a layer. Uh, these other three show no change really. They kind of all look the same. Um, in fact, uh, for copper sulfate and calcium chloride, it looks just like water. And for copper sulfate and potassium chloride, again, no significant change. Here, no significant change, interesting. All right, now we're looking back at our copper sulfate samples and we can see pretty clearly now that a reaction has uh, occurred with the uh, calcium chloride. We're seeing precipitate form and start to fall to the bottom. Uh, we already saw the reaction happen with the sodium hydroxide. We can see it a little better now, but clearly that one's happened as well. We still can't see uh, the reaction uh, with the hydrochloric acid. We'll have to use some sort of indicator to suss that out. Okay, now it's time for our hydrochloric acid tests. We got some HCl in there, some in there, and some in there. To uh, so the first one, we're going to add sodium hydroxide. We predict a reaction here. Sodium hydroxide's a base. Doesn't look like anything's going on. Let's add our calcium chloride. and our potassium chloride. And we see no visible reaction. All right, with our hydrochloric acid, we predicted that the sodium hydroxide would react, that the sodium would leave the hydroxide, go to the chlorine, form salt, sodium chloride, and we'd also get water, a covalent compound, but we didn't see any evidence of that. Um, we predicted that these two, both cl uh, chloride compounds, wouldn't react, right? Because why would um, chlorine replace chlorine? Doesn't make any sense. Okay, now to actually make sure if this if didn't, reaction didn't happen, let's add a little bit of indicator. So I'm going to put in some phenylphthalein. And in all three of these, we get kind of a milky looking solution. Phenolphthalein is an indicator that should turn kind of bright pink uh, in the presence of a base. So let's add some base. You can see as soon as I add the sodium hydroxide, the solution turns pink, but then it quickly turns back to this kind of milky color. Let's just keep adding. Starting to stay pink. Let's see if that's enough to make it stay. Nope. Keep going. And now our solution has a nice rich pink color. Let's see if that's true with these other two. Keep adding some chlorine, some calcium chloride, 
Nope, I can add calcium chloride all day and I won't get that reaction. Uh, let's, say, let's try the same with potassium chloride. Nope. nope. And nope. Okay. So adding those two until my heart's content, I don't um, see the indicator work with um, the addition of the phenolphthalein. It most definitely does work. So there you go. This one actually did have a chemical reaction. Even though we couldn't first see it, we had to use some other chemical means to see that reaction. And again, with our sodium hydroxide and our hydrochloric acid, this is called a neutralization reaction. You'll learn about it later. Um, basically, we take a base and an acid, add them together, and you get mostly water, um, and all water if you do it perfectly, and then some other sort of compound. In this case, it's salt, sodium chloride. Okay, there you go. So here we have some hydrochloric acid. We're gonna add some pure sodium hydroxide. Let's see what happens. Okay, now we have our two test tubes filled with our um, sodium hydroxide. Let's put in some calcium chloride and some potassium chloride. Uh, I don't see any evidence of a reaction right now, but let's give it some time. Okay, now we can see that no reaction happened with the um, potassium chloride, but with the calcium chloride we have a lot of precipitate formed, so uh, definitely a reaction happened there. With the um, sodium hydroxide reactions, the reason uh, it reacted with calcium chloride is because it forms calcium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide is not soluble in water. So that's why we see this precipitate form. Our last reaction is calcium chloride. We, we're gonna stick some potassium chloride in there and we see no reaction, right? Uh, both of them are chlorides, so there's no reason to trade because they're both already bonded to chlorine. So uh, no reaction.